Okay, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala al-nabuuthi rahmatan lil alameen. Nabiyyina wa habibina wa sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So this is the 11th session of this series. And inshallah today will be the final session where we talk about the topic of takfir. And takfir we said means, what does takfir mean? What does the word takfir mean? To declare a Muslim to be a disbeliever. So we talked about in some detail uh, the issues around the topic of takfir. And we've talked about who is allowed to pass the ruling or pass the judgment of takfir. We've talked about the actions upon which takfir can be done or for which takfir can be done. The types of actions, last session. And today, inshallah, we'll be talking about the mawani. And the mawani is a term that means the obstacles i.e. the things that will prevent the ruling to be applied upon an individual. So now we are actually moving to talk about the individual himself or herself. When can the actual ruling of the fear be applied upon that individual? And in order for that ruling to be applied upon an individual, first of all, <clears throat> the person who is passing the judgment must be capable of doing so. Secondly, the person who is, uh, must have done an act or believed in something, or said something, that warrants the kfir to be passed in the first place. Right. And, thirdly, the, uh, and thirdly, the person himself, there must be no impediments, no obstacles in the way that prevent the ruling being passed upon that individual. So, as a quick summary of what we covered so far, we talked about something called the asal of the deen, what is the essential nature, what's the foundation of this religion? What is this religion all about in its basic essentials? When you strip everything away, what is Islam all about? Anybody remember? Yeah? Tawheed. Tawheed. The belief in the absolute oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else is Islam all about generally when we strip everything away? And we're left with just the core elements of Islam. What is Islam all about? Submission. Submission. Submission to, the, uh, to Allah. Submission to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or acceptance of following the revealed law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Submission to the revealed law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person, the, the foundation of the religion includes the belief that we must submit to the law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. Yes, we may fall short now and then, but the belief must be there that we have to follow the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else? The third component, which is linked to following the law actually. Following the Prophet. Following the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa which is what Muhammad Rasulullah is all about, right? Mutaba of the Messenger alayhi salatu wa Again, in general, we accept and uh, acknowledge the fact that we must follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We must take him as our role model. So this is basically what Islam is all about. These three components. When you strip all the rules and regulations away, what's left is the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's left is this belief that we must adhere to the revealed law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This belief that we must follow the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is basically what the core of Islam is all about. And when we talk about takfir, those things that are takfirable or upon which takfir can be done are those things that violate this core. Those things that violate this core. Right? And we said that uh, in terms of categorization of the deeds and statements of, uh, that upon which kufr can be pronounced, we said that we get the first category, which is a deed or a statement that is clearly kufr. 100%. There's no doubt about it. This person has stated something about, uh, stated a statement of kufr, or he has done an action of kufr. Give me an example of what we talked about. Blasphemy, yep. Yeah. Go cursing Allah and His Messenger, for example, we mentioned. A person who curses Allah and His Messenger and knows what he is saying, he's not mad or it's not a slip of the tongue, he knows what he's saying. Such a person is guilty of major disbelief. We don't need to ask any further questions, right? We don't need to ask, do you think it's halal to curse Allah? What was your belief in the heart when you said not, what was your belief in your heart when you said this? We don't need to ask these questions. We don't need to investigate. This statement goes against the very core of our religion. To curse Allah, to curse the Messenger of Allah goes against the core of our, of our religion. Right? 
So if a person knows what he's saying, this person is guilty of major disbelief. Another example. That's an example of a statement. Yeah? So just a question. When you say you don't have to inquire, um, so you don't need to know if they were ignorant in that, but do you still have to inquire about whether they were coerced? Uh, yes. So, so there's certain things we need to... Uh, we'd come, that's what we're talking about today, inshallah. But what we're looking at right now is the actual action itself. Right? So this statement is so clear that it's kufr, so long as a person knows what he's doing, and of course, as you correctly stated, he wasn't forced to say what he said. Give me an example of a deed that's like this as well, a deed now, an action. Making sujood to uh, other than Allah. Making sujood, now we didn't talk, that's not a clear-cut action. Uh, yes? Mockery of religion. Mockery of religion. Mocking the religion, when we talked about some of the details around that. Mocking religion is major disbelief. What else did we mention? Quran, Disrespecting the Quran, yeah. So you know this is the Quran and you throw it in the bin, for example. Right? You know this is the Mus'haf and you throw it in the bin. Disrespect of the Mus'haf, disrespect of the Quran is an act of, ma is an act of major kufr. Um, we then talked about certain acts that could be kufr or could not be kufr. There's a possibility. Give me an example of this. Burning Sorry? Burning the Burning the Musaf, yeah. Burning the Musaf is a good example. What else do we talk about? <coughs> rejecting some aspects of the Sharia. Uh, rejecting some aspects of the Sharia, okay. Right? Yes? Prostrating to a person. Prostrating to a person, yeah. So the action of prostrating to a person we said that the action of prostrating to a human being in and of itself is not necessarily an act of shirk or kufr. Why? Because in the previous nations, the act of sajda existed as a greeting or as a way of honoring and respecting a person. And that was replaced in Islam with the salam, saying assalamu alaikum. So when a person makes sajda to a human being, like uh, Mu'az made sajda to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa we need to ask, why did you do this action? We now need to inquire. Previously, you don't need to inquire beyond, did you know what you're saying? Were you coerced? Now we need to actually investigate and ask questions. What are you actually doing? What are you actually doing? And if the question, and if the answer is, I'm worshipping this individual, the person's guilty of major kufr. But if the, person, the answer is, I'm actually paying respect to him, or I'm giving him salam, then it's not major kufr. Right? So there's certain categories of actions that can be kufr and cannot be kufr. Uh, any other examples we can um, think of? <coughs> we mentioned the example of Hatib and Abi, Abi Balta'a. Who remembers? Sorry, I oh, didn't hate your hand up. Go on. Can you say supplicate to the dead? Supplicate to the dead, we're going to talk about that. But yes, um, Supplicating to the dead is not always a case of major shirk and major kufr. We're going to talk about that in a few sessions' time, inshallah. But yeah, we need to, we need to inquire a bit further. There. And it also depends on the, the method or the, the, the way in which the supplication is being done as well. Yeah? Um, uh, like treason. Treason, yeah. So Hatib ibn Abi Balta, he... Uh, just before the conquest of Mecca, we can talk about this again today, uh, he sent a letter to the pagans of Mecca outlining the plans of the Messenger, right? outlining the plans of the Messenger, and this of course is treason, right? And it's outwardly, it seems to be siding with the Kuffar against the Muslims, siding with the Kuffar against the Muslims. And we said actually, this action as well actually requires investigation because it could be a case of major Kuffar, it could be a case of something, uh, a, a major sin. We talked about it last time. We'll revisit that today, inshallah, as well. Okay, we did talk about other categories, but we'll move on to the actual topic for today. And the topic for today is the mawani, as I said. And the mawani are the obstacles or the things that prevent us actually passing a ruling of disbelief on the individual himself. 
So we talked about the action. So now this individual, he is guilty of an action upon which takfir can be pronounced. Right. So he's guilty of an action upon which takfir can be pronounced. But before he can be declared a ruling, uh, an actual disbeliever or an apostate, we need to go through certain steps with regards to that individual himself. So the first thing we need to establish, or the basic principle here, the basic principle, is that before the person can be declared a disbeliever, the evidence must be established upon him. Evidence must be established that he is actually a disbeliever. That's the basic principle here. Um, in some, and then what level of evidence needs to be established depends upon the actual type of crime he is guilty of. So when a person has done an action of disbelief, or he has said a statement of disbelief, the first thing we need to do is establish whether he has been coerced, or she has been coerced. Ikrah in Arabic. Ikrah. Has there, is there an element of coercion? Was that person forced to do what he did or say what he said. And Ikra is generally the fuqaha when the scholars talk about coercion, they divide it into two categories. The first is Ikra term, which is complete coercion or absolute co coercion. And this is where a person is being forced to do something uh, with a threat of physical harm or death upon him or upon somebody else, like, like his family or whatever. Right? And the person who is threatening him has the ability to make it happen. It's not, it's not an empty threat, he can actually carry, carry out his threat. So the person is being uh, threatened with torture or death, either of himself or of somebody close to him. And uh, the person who is threatening has the ability to carry out what he is threatening. This is known as uh, perfect or complete coercion. So the point about the ability to carry out that becomes quite subjective, isn't it? Yeah, so we can talk about this. It is subjective, right? And this generally the scholars would categorize it in the case of the, as falling under the category of darura, right? Falling under the category of necessity. Someone is being forced to do something because he has no other choice. The other choice would be torture or death. Right. So this is a category of darura. Second is ikrah natis, or an incomplete coercion. And this is basically a threat of a non-fatal beating. Right. Something that, you know, perhaps, uh, or imprisonment, or destruction of some of the wealth, not all of the wealth. Or a similar non-fatal event happening to friends or family. And here, darura does not necessarily apply. So here it's not necessarily a case of darura, uh, because a person can bear these things with patience and still survive at the other uh, at the other end, or not lose any necessity or basic necessity of life at the other side of this of this of this threat. Does that make sense? So the complete coercion and the incomplete coercion, and. One of the things that the scholars discuss here is, can a person be coerced into killing somebody else? Or if he's coerced, I'm gonna, if, I, if you don't kill this person, an innocent person, I'm going to shoot you, I'm going to kill you. And then that person goes and kills that person. Is this allowed for him to do? By consensus, it's not allowed for him to do. By consensus. It's not allowed for him to kill someone else to save his own life. It's not allowed to kill someone else to save your own life. Now, when we're talking about coercion, coercion can only happen in actions and words. It cannot happen in belief. Coercion can only happen in actions and words. It cannot happen in belief. You can't be forced to actually change your belief. You can pretend you've done so, but you can't actually be forced to change your belief. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to Nahl, مَنْ كَفْرَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ أُفْرِهَا وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ صَدْرًا فَعَلَيْهِمْ غَضَبٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ That whoever disbelieves in Allah after belief, with the exception 
of those who have been forced to do so. With the exception of those who have been forced to do so, with the condition that their hearts remain firm in faith. Right, so Allah SWT gives an exception here. That whoever disbelieves in Allah after belief, provided that he has not been forced to do so, and if he's been forced to do so, his heart has still got faith in it. Right? Because the heart, the, the belief can't change. But then, but then Allah says, well, like, But those who embrace disbelief wholeheartedly, they will be condemned by Allah and suffer a tremendous punishment. Right? So here Allah is saying, those who embrace disbelief wholeheartedly, how do you embrace disbelief wholeheartedly? You accept it as a belief. You accept disbelief as your belief. Right? So whoever embraces disbelief wholeheartedly, they're condemned by Allah will suffer a tremendous punishment. But whoever is, says statements of disbelief or actions of disbelief while being forced and his heart still is, is firm in faith, he doesn't fall under this threat, under this category at all. Uh, 106, chapter 16, verse 106. So coercion can only happen in words or deeds. A person can only be forced to say something or do something. And when does it actually become an excuse for that person? When does coercion actually become an excuse for that person? Uh, when the person is able to carry out the threat as I've already said. The person who is being coerced is unable to prevent it from happening. And the person thinks that it's likely to happen. The person, not just that he's certain it's going to happen, he thinks it's likely that this threat will be carried out. So these three things. So the one who is coercing is able to carry out the action. The one who is being coerced is unable to stop it from happening. And also he thinks that it's likely that it will actually happen itself. <coughs> and this is why we find in an example that uh, from the seal of the Messenger that there was a group of people in Mecca who had said the Shahada but they would aid and support the polytheists and they left Mecca on a, on a task one time thinking that if they met any of the companions of the Messenger they would have nothing to fear but when the companions learned about them leaving and knew who they were they went out to kill them and they started arguing amongst each other you know uh, are we allowed to kill them or are we not allowed to kill them? They've said the Shahada. These people have said the Shahada. Allah revealed an ayah. And what's important is that these people in Mecca who was uh, supporting the polytheists against the Muslims are doing so without any fear. They're not, they're not, they're not scared of losing their lives. They're not being coerced by the polytheists. They're doing so without any fear. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an ayah about this group of people. He says, فَمَا لَكُمْ فِي الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِئَتَيْنَ why have you become two parties and argue amongst yourselves with regards to these munafiqs? Allah regarded them as munafiqin. He called them munafiqin, right? Why? Because there's no reason for them to be doing what they're doing. They weren't being coerced. So Allah actually regarded these individuals to be disbelievers in this case. Yes? Because they're a group of people who you have to individually like, inquire about their reasons for doing it. Yeah, so if we're going to pass in rulings on individuals, we need to approach each individual. Here, Allah, of course, has passed the ruling on them already. So this is an exception. But for us, we will need to approach each individual and investigate for that particular, uh, for each case. So, like declaring the fear on somebody, um, there is also like a criteria for declaring someone a Munafiq. Is that correct? Um, so... So this, uh, that's a very good question. Can we declare someone to be a munafiq? And the answer to that is because a munafiq, by, his, by definition, is something that's, you know, his heart is saying something different, opposite to, his, uh, to what he's showing outside. Only Allah can pass that ruling, not us. We can say you, go as we can say you have aspects of nifaq, we're guilty of aspects of hypocrisy, but we can't say you are a munafiq, as in the category of munafiqin. Yeah? Allah knows best. 
Yeah. This group were recognized as before Allah. This group were recognized as disbelievers, or they, they were recognized as being people who said the Shahada, but were openly supporting the disbelievers against the Muslims. Against the, against the Muslims. That's what they were recognized as. And they regard active, uh, and they and there was no coercion happening or, or at all like that, anything like that. So, so if a person has been coerced to say a statement of kufr or do an action of kufr, uh, what's his ruling? And we have an example of this action that happened in the time of the Messenger, Amar ibn Yasir. He was tortured by the polytheists. Until he cursed the Prophet ﷺ. Cursing the Messenger of Allah is major kufr, right? And he started, he started praising the false gods. Again, this is major kufr. And when he did this, the polytheists stopped torturing him. So again, he wasn't killed, he's being tortured. And then he came to the Messenger ﷺ. And the Messenger of Allah said, When you said these statements, what was the state of your heart? What was in your heart when you said these statements? He replied, my heart was safe and sound with regards to Iman. The Iman was still there, there was nothing wrong. Uh, the, my Iman didn't waver, right? it was still there. And so the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if they do it again, do what you did again. If they do it again, do what you did again. And this is when this ayah of Sufi Nahal was revealed, I just quoted. Whoever disbelieves in Allah after their belief, but not those who have been forced to do so while their hearts are firm in faith. But those who embrace disbelief wholeheartedly, they will be condemned by Allah and suffer a tremendous punishment. So this is the basis for pretty much all the scholars saying that it's allowed to articulate or do statements of disbelief, say, uh, articulate statements of disbelief or do actions of disbelief in such situations. But also, there is another consensus here as well. That consensus is, is that the person who is being coerced to say a statement of kufr, or do an action of kufr, but chooses death instead, he actually has a greater reward than a person who takes the concession. So he chooses death instead. Rather than saying statements of kufr or doing actions of kufr, he has a greater reward then they want to take the concession of being allowed to take, say the statement of kufr or do the action of kufr. So, what are the three conditions when ikrar becomes an excuse, when coercion actually becomes an excuse, a valid excuse for that person? When, what are the three conditions I mentioned? The oppressor is capable. The oppressor is capable of carrying out his threat, yeah? The, the oppressed is unable to, to... Yeah. The oppressor is unable to prevent it from happening. And the third one? He thinks it's likely to happen. He thinks it's likely to happen, yeah. And we said that what's a coercion cannot happen in what? In the heart. Coercion cannot happen in the heart in belief, in, in, in points of belief. Now, Do you, you see, there's consensus that if somebody chooses death over, um, like saying, statements of kufr, that's, is that consensus that, that's better? That's better, yeah. It's consensus that it's better. Now, as uh, Brother Fahad mentioned early, earlier, this is actually quite subjective. Is there a defined limit to what ikra actually is, what coercion actually is? Is there a set defined limit? The answer is no. It's all relative. It varies from time to time, place to place, person to person. Right? Because it could be that the person, the, the one who's being coerced, you know, everybody has different abilities, everybody has different strengths, everybody has different weaknesses. Some people can bear torture more than other people, etc. The, the condition of the one who's coercing is one in terms of his ability and his strength and what he can get away with, what he can't get away with. All of these things, they're all very sub subjective. And that's why, because of the relative subjective nature of this, in order for this excuse to be established, it must be done by a scholar, it must be done by the Qadi. There must be an investigation that's carried out by a person who's capable of carrying out the investigation to ascertain whether uh, coercion was actually a valid excuse for that person. So the Qadi or the scholar is the one who uh, carries out the judgment here and makes a determination as to whether 
coercion actually happened here or not, or if it's a valid case or not. Yes. Back to the example that you mentioned of the uh, in Makkah. I'm sorry? The Mushriks in Makkah. In that situation, if Allah had not revealed that verse, would they decide themselves? Uh, the Messenger of Allah, would, in that situation, the Messenger of Allah would have decided. So they would have come to the Messenger of Allah and they would have a. They would have, he would, because the Messenger of Allah is, is acting as a Qadi at that time, right? So he would have decided in that situation. This is the first obstacle. We must first establish whether the person has been coerced into saying or doing what he did. The second is jahl, ignorance. Is the person ignorant? Now, of course, ignorance, I mean, actually, the whole issue of jahl is, is probably the most complicated area of Mawani, in the, what we're talking about here. So I'm, I'm, I'm only giving an overview. But this is a thing where it's been debated the most historically and contem in contemporary times as well. Of course, a person cannot be ignorant of the foundation of the religion. If you're ignorant of the foundation of the religion, you're not a Muslim in the first place. If you're ignorant that Allah is one, if you're ignorant that we should follow the, uh, I don't believe that the Messenger of Allah should be followed. I don't believe that you know uh, the Sharia should be uh, apply, uh, complied, should be followed. The person, the, the foundation of the religion is not there in, in him in the first place. So you can't be ignorant of the foundation of the religion. But a person who is guilty of many types of kufr acts or many types of shirk acts can be excused for being ignorant and in case and in reality many people in the world today and in the past who have been or are guilty of such actions are very ignorant people they don't know any better what they're doing is uh, they're doing because they believe this is religion they've been taught by other people this is religion right they don't know any better at all they most of them are, you know many of them are illiterate so jahl is an actual excuse that prevents the ruling of kufr and shirk being applied to an individual. It doesn't change the nature of the action. The action remains kufr. The action remains shirk, right? When a person is making dua in those scenarios we talk in some scenarios to the dead person in the grave, right? The action remains kufr and shirk. It doesn't change. But the person may be excused because he doesn't know any better. Or he's been taught and he's being taught incorrectly. He doesn't know any better, full stop, right? <coughs> and we gave an example of a person from the, that, that was mentioned by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, who was actually excused because he was ignorant. Who can remember that example? No, not your rating in the masjid. Qudama uh, ibn Mathun is one example. But that was after the time of the Messenger. I'm talking about during the time of the Messenger. Oh, it was about hanging the swords on the... That and what? It's actually a good example, but that's not what I quoted last time. Yeah. The person who was drinking alcohol. No, that's after the time of the Messenger. That example, yeah. The man was cremated. Cremated, yeah. A man who was on his deathbed was greatly fearful about what would come after life. He said, basically, if Allah was to have power over me, he would punish me with a punishment not given out to anybody before me or after me. And so what did he do? He said he advised his children to burn him and scatter his ashes in, in the wind. Scatter his ashes everywhere, basically. Believing that if this happened, then Allah would not be able to resurrect that individual. Allah would not be able to resurrect that individual. And so his children carried out his wish. They burnt him, scattered his ashes, and then Allah resurrected him, brought him back together again. He ordered the ashes to come back together again, and he was resurrected. Then Allah asks him, why did you do this? And the man said, because I was scared of you. My fear of you led me to do this. And so Allah forgave him. Now this person, what was the excuse that he had that led to Allah forgiving him? He didn't know any better. He was ignorant. He was ignorant. He wasn't ignorant about the core of the religion, he believed in the resurrection, he believed in Allah's power. But there were certain aspects of Allah's power that you can only know after revelation has come to you that he was unaware of. Right? And as a result, he felt that he could get away from being resurrected by, uh, by, this, uh, by doing what he did. So he was ignorant, and it was ignorance that excuses the individual. 
Likewise, we talked about um, Qudama ibn Mad'un. <coughs> uh, but that's actually uh, another, uh, the, um, that's actually a, it falls in a different category. Um, and ignorance and the level of ignorance, again, what's the level of ignorance for which a person can be excused? Again, it varies from time to time, place to place, person to person. A person who is working day and night on a farm in, the middle, uh, in Pakistan, for example, who can't even read and write, is held to different standards to a person, people like us in the West, who are literate and have very little excuse, you know, have access to you know, the internet, have access to Qur'ans, have access to books, have access to scholars, etc., etc. The, judge, the way we judge these two individuals is very different. The person in the, in, 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 in the farm in Pakistan and us sitting here today, right? The standards are very different, right? So it changes from time to time and place to place. In some places, for example, ignorance could be very high. At some times, ignorance could be very high. And some places, the ignorance may be less. At some times, ignorance may be left less as well. So again, this goes back to the scholar making a judgment as to whether the ignorance or the excuse of ignorance can apply to that particular individual. <coughs> I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to start speeding up a bit. Um, the third category is ta'wil. It's what we call ta'wil. And this is a generally done by people of knowledge. Uh, they have basically, ta'wil basically means, uh, uh, here we, we can translate it as misunderstanding or misinterpretation. A person misunderstood the texts or misinterpreted them, understood them incorrectly. And that led him towards an action which is kufr. To say an action which is kufr or to do an action which is kufr. So they have, uh, their intention, their goal was sincere from the onset. They were trying to find the truth. They were trying to establish the truth and act upon the truth. That was their goal from the onset. But they misunderstood the texts. They never understood them correctly. And they ended up believing that something was allowed to do, which was not actually allowed for them to do. And so, in this case, the action again remains kufr, but this person is excused because he genuinely misunderstood. He genuinely misinterpreted the texts. <coughs> and an example of this is what? Qudama ibn Mat'un, right? He genuinely misunderstood the texts, right? He believed he drank alcohol, and I guess this is, this is after the time of the Sahaba now. He drank alcohol, believing it is halal to drink alcohol, knowing the verses in the Qur'an prohibiting the drinking of alcohol. Right. He knew the verses of the Qur'an prohibiting the drinking of alcohol, but he believed it was halal for him to drink alcohol. Why? Because he misunderstood, genuinely misunderstood, an ayah of the Qur'an. The ayah being Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 93, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاحٌ فِي مَا تَعِنُوا That there's no blame on those who believe and do good deeds for what they eat and drink. إِذَا مَتَّقَوْا وَآمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Provided they have taqwa of Allah, provided they have faith, provided they are doing good. So Qudama said, I have taqwa of Allah. I have faith, I'm doing good deeds. Therefore, this means that whatever I eat and drink is halal for me to do so. This was his understanding of this ayah. Therefore, he knew that the prohibition was there, but he believed that he was exempted from that prohibition of, because, because of this ayah. Umar bin al-Khattab, when this case was raised to him, he said, you misunderstood. He said, you misunderstood. You misunderstood what the ayah means because if you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will avoid what he has prohibited and he has prohibited alcohol and therefore he had him lashed. But he did not declare him to be a disbeliever. Even though there's clear verses in the Quran prohibiting the drinking of alcohol. Likewise, Hatib ibn Abi Balta, right? When he sent the letter 
We talked about this incident last, uh, last session. When he sent the letter to Mecca and it, it was, uh, 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 they intercepted it, and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asked him why he had done this, why he had done what he had done. Now what Hatib has done is openly kufr. It's apparently kufr, right? Because he has uh, betrayed the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by disclosing his plans to the pagans. And he has seemingly sided with the pagans, the polytheists, against the Muslims. But what did Hatib ibn Abi Balta say? He said that I haven't apostated. I'm still a believer. I never once, dis I never once doubted Allah and His Messenger. That never even entered my heart. But I believe the promise of victory that Allah has given to the Messenger, and I believed that that promise will happen no matter what I do. And I fear for my family and my possessions that are living in Mecca, and therefore I felt that if I uh, sent this letter to them, I'd protect my family and protect my property. But I will not have impacted your victory because that's going to happen anyway. This was his understanding, right? This was his understanding. And so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam excused him. He said, "Yes, this is uh, you know this is a genuine misinterpretation from this individual, Hatib ibn Abi Balta. He's a person who fought in Badr." The Messenger of Allah, uh, Abu bin Khattab is there, and he's angry, he's hot and heated, right? He goes, let me kill this munafiq, let me kill this kafir. Uh, the Messenger of Allah did not object to the words of Umar. He didn't say, why are you calling him a munafiq or, or a kafir? Because outwardly what he's doing is an action of kufr and nifaq. But the Messenger of Allah has ascertained that in this scenario, he himself is not guilty of becoming a kafir or a munafiq. And then he said, uh, he is a person who participated in Badr. And how do you know? Perhaps Allah looked at those who witnessed, or, uh, witnessed Badr and said, Oh, people of Badr, do what you like, for I have forgiven you. So, this was, so the Messenger of Allah regarded his participating in Badr as being sufficient to expiate this particular sin. Had he been guilty of Kufr, his participation in Badr wouldn't have been enough. Yeah. Kufr is Kufr, it destroys your good deeds. Right. So, this is an example of another example of somebody making a or misinterpreting the texts. And that leads him to do an outward action of kufr, but he himself is excused. He himself is excused for that action. But the action itself remains as a possible act of major kufr here in, ter in terms of siding with the polytheists against the uh, Muslims. Yes? Does that mean you could pick up a scripture, a book, read it, make your own interpretation, carry on with it until somebody tells you you're doing something wrong? Oh no, so th th these people, they misinterpreted while having the tools to make the interpretation in the first place. A person who just picks up the book of the Quran and decides to interpret it out of his own women desires is guilty of a major sin. And that is interpreting the Quran out of his own desires. Right? He, may not, he may be excused for becoming a disbeliever, but he's still guilty of that major sin of interpreting the Quran without knowledge. Yeah? Who determines whether or not he has the tools to... Again, this is all scholars. So we've talked about this repeatedly, and it's very important for us to understand. This is all down to scholars. It's not down to uh, us as individuals. So would that mean the scholar will have to question? Yeah, again, a qu questioning has to be done, especially in this type of case, where a person has made, misinterpreted the Quran, or misinterpreted the Sunnah. It's a scholar who will have to establish whether he actually genuinely misinterpreted it, right? Or whether there's another reason there. So this is the third case, that we misinterpretation. The fourth case, the fourth and final case, the, the fourth and final mani or obstacle is khata or an error, a genuine mistake. Now, a genuine mistake we can actually really fall into a case of that we, the previous category, or even fall into a case of ignorance, right? But they mention it as a separate category just to, just to, um, just to make it absolutely clear. And a genuine mistake is, you know, a person is trying to say something or trying to do something, but what actually happens is not what he wanted to happen. What actually comes out of his mouth is not actually what he wanted to come out of his mouth. A slip of the tongue, an accident in action, right? So he's just literally talking an accident or a mistake. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> he says in Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33, verse five, bihi. There's no blame on you for those things you made mistakes in. But only for what your hearts intended, what you deliberately did. So what you made genuine mistakes for, 
There's no harm. You're not going to be blamed for that. But what you deliberately did, that's what you're held accountable for. رَبَّنَا لَا تُعَاخِذْنَا إِنَّ سِينَا وَأَخْطَأْنَا Right? So at the end of Surah Baqarah. Our Lord, do not blame us if we have forgotten or erred. Do not blame us if we have forgotten or erred. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, when this ayah was revealed, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in response to this dua, I have done so. I, I will not take you to blame if you have forgotten or erred. Can you make a mistake in matters of belief? Yes, you can. It's perfectly possible for a person to make matters, uh, mistakes in matters of action and statements and have incorrect beliefs. Right? So long as they don't contradict the foundation of the religion, those would be regarded to be incorrect beliefs that are not allowed to hold, but a person will not be regarded to be a disbeliever for them. And we have lots of you know, subsidiary examples where the Salaf themselves uh, differed with each other about points of belief. Right? Did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa see Allah or not on the night's journey? Was the night's journey done, was it a dream or was it a physical journey? And there are, lots of, there are numerous cases like this where the Sahaba differed amongst themselves, but they never declared each other to be belie- uh, disbelievers. But they did declare each other to be mistaken in, in their beliefs. So, uh, so these are the four excuses that generally are regarded to be obstacles preventing the ruling of disbelief to be applied upon the individual. What are these four? Who can repeat them to me? What are these four? Yeah. yeah Ikra, coercion. Yeah. And um, Jahl. Jahl. So coercion, ignorance, misinterpretation, and error. Ign- uh, coercion, ignorance, misinterpretation, and error. So a person can be uh, excused if he's fallen into one of these four categories. So the action remains the action of kufr and shirk. A person who's making a supplication to a dead person in the grave. The action remains shirk, but he himself may be excused because he doesn't know any better. Right? He himself may be excused because he's made that we. He's misinterpreted some of the texts of the book in the Sunnah. He himself can be excused. He might have made a genuine mistake. Right? He may, he may, be, may, may, may be a slip of the tongue. And in regards to the masses of, of, of the Muslims, they also have the excuse of what we call taqlid. Right, taqlid being meaning blind or blind following. Where the people don't know any better, they're just following you know, people they believe to be scholars or people of knowledge. And if the people of knowledge are excused because they can misinterpret or make errors, then more so for the people of blindly following them because they, they don't know any better. And this is actually the case for the majority of the Muslims doing actions that we regard to be kufr and shirk. Right? They're just blindly following people they regard to be religious. Their imams, their peers, their saints, their their awliya, whatever, their ulama, whatever, they're just blindly following them. And if we can excuse the, who they're following because of misinterpretation, because of mistakes, because of uh, coercion, because of ignorance, then more so those who are actually following these individuals as well. Does that make sense? So it's important for us to understand that shirk remains shirk and kufr remains kufr. All that we're saying here is that that ruling may not be applied to individuals until these obstacles are removed first. Yes? Does that mean if there is like a scholar who we deem to be a deviant, but they, gen- like they present their arguments and whatnot, would that mean that they would be misinterpreting the text and they wouldn't be deemed a, like, that they wouldn't be Yes, that would exa- that's exactly what it means. And in fact, you'll see that... <coughs> Especially when it comes to, and we can talk about this in, in the section of Ibadah, worship, when it comes to what we call istighatha, seeking help from the dead, right, which is an action of shirk. Right? You find that they, those who do it, the people of knowledge from amongst what they do, they have their misinterpretations of the text, and they have their justifications for what, why they're doing it. So we would say that in this case, the ruling may not apply to you, but the action remains shirk. Does that make sense to you? And we talk about this, uh, inshallah, in a few sessions time.